Thank you, Lisa, and hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's having a good day. The weather is great. Uh, my name is Shaz Akram, and I'm the Deputy Director at the Fulbright Association. So welcome, and thanks for joining our career series. Um, I hope you can't hear my daughter in the background. <laughs> if you did, then I hope my husband takes her away. Um, <laughs> So alumni, as well as the young professionals in our, cre uh, in our network, uh, this, these, these webinars are primarily created for them. The Fulbright Association is an independent nonprofit established in 1977, representing 140,000 U.S. alumni. Through our 54 local chapters, the association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year. We advocate for the program and promote international education. We also invite you to consider subscribing to our mailing list and joining as a member at Fulbright.org. I would now like to introduce our two speakers, Andrew Evans and Liz Newman. Andrew is a retired CFO from Wellesley College. He has served in the Foreign Service with USAID overseas and in Washington, D.C., and later served as Associate Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He is also a Fulbrighter, went to the UK in 1992 on a Fulbright Administrator Grant. Liz Newman has over 30 years of experience in financial management, organizational consulting, and executive search. With an established track record of serving clients in higher education, Liz is a trusted confidant and advisor to university presidents, provosts, and boards. She's also recently retired managing partner at Koya Leadership Partners. Um, and I also would like to introduce our lovely Lisa Boucher, our program manager. She's also a Fulbrighter, ETA to Peru. And um, of course, you had a good dose of reality of adding a new element to this presentation today, a three and a half year old. So I <laughs> Thanks, Shaz. Um, yeah, so super glad to have you guys here. I just want to give a couple of norms before we get started. If you, everyone can just make sure your microphone uh, stays on mute, unless you want us to meet your three-year-olds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we do ask for you to keep your, your cameras off so we can just help with the bandwidth and minimize any distractions. And we will have the chat box running throughout the, the conversation. If you have questions, please feel free to use that chat function and we'll try to answer some questions throughout and then we'll have a more in-depth Q&A session at the end. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Liz and Andy. Thanks, Lisa, very much. And hi, everyone, glad you're with us today. Um, this is the fourth session, fourth webinar. And uh, remember session one was, uh, we launched the search. Uh, session two, we built the resume. Uh, session three, we submitted an application uh, with the resume, a letter of interest uh, or cover letter. And then in session four, now we have the interview. And so we want to talk a little bit about how to prepare yourself for an interview and some of the questions around um, what it means to get to this point in the, in the search process. One of the earlier questions uh, that you'll be asked to uh, about would be, would you be available for an online interview? Or would you be available if the first interview is an online interview, would you then come in uh, and meet us, let's assume it's beyond the pandemic or close to the end, um, that would you be available for a personal interview? And then if it's a live interview, how do you prepare for that? How do you prepare and present yourself to uh, be convincing that, uh, and that you present your skills in the best possible way? Uh, you finish the interview, what happens, what should you do, and then uh, we've added a last session here, a little uh, conversation about what to do uh, during a pandemic and talking about uh, the interview process then. So hopefully you'll um, stick around for that. So the first question is, uh, you've been offered an interview and the interview is going to be an online interview. There are some similarities between an online interview and an in-person interview, but let's talk about the online interview and how you should approach this. So um, the first question is, you need to find out, do you know everything you need to know for this interview? And you want to thoroughly research the interview, or rather the institution you're interviewing with, and you wanna make sure that you understand their mission 
and anticipate the kinds of questions that they may ask. So there are lots of ways to go about this. You do this all the time, I'm sure, but this is a list. So do a Google search on the company or the institution. Review the institution's website. Pay particular attention to the mission uh, about us or the team. Uh, and in particular, the news section. That'll bring you up to date um, of anything that they've posted on their site. Also look for any press releases or press article. That's very important. And on the day, this is really important. On the day of the interview, first thing in the morning, do a last minute check uh, of their website to see if there's any new exciting news, a new development that they've just announced in the last 24 hours. Um, or maybe there's something in the press, something unfortunate that the CFO has just been arrested for embezzlement. Uh, you you want to be sure that you go into this interview with the latest information possible. So do a last minute check. And finally, if the organization is a nonprofit, you can review its IRS 990 filing and get lots of information um, about the organization. It, it will give you all kinds of financial information, but we'll also talk about uh, who the movers and shakers are within the uh, organization. So then if you've been able to ask the person who invited you to come and interview, if you've been able to secure a list of the people you will be meeting with, maybe it's more than one, but the goal is to learn as much about your interviewer's background and their roles in the organization as possible. So again, do a Google search on the person, uh, review that person's individual LinkedIn page, and review any information about these individuals that's actually on the institution's website. Sometimes they're quite lengthy bios. It will give you a better sense of what this person is bringing to the institution, maybe how they might be, how, how that person has been approaching this particular role. Find out as much as you can. And, and we'll, go ahead. No, go ahead, Andy. The only thing I was going to say is that that's information, that's background information. That's not necessarily information that you share. We'll come back to that in a minute. Right, good background information to have. And once you've done that research, um, you wanna think about where you are gonna place yourself as you do this interview. Will you be at home? Um, and if you're at home, um, where, where is the best place for you to be sitting for the interview? So what does the background look like? Um, it says a lot, I mean, I know you've all been doing a lot of Zooms lately and so, I'm always curious about books and things that are behind people, but you wanna make it as, as neat and uncluttered as possible, but in, in a place that is nice, nice setting. If, you, if, you, if there's a window that has a nice view, it's possible to do that or a painting that's nice, just to give yourself some context, not necessarily just a white wall. Um, you want your face to be illuminated, not to have a halo around it. So play with it, you know, so I, I do this now on Zoom. So I move my computer into different places in my apartment to see what the lighting is like and how it looks. And you want to do the same thing. You want to check your audio. Is your equipment charged? Is it plugged in? Is it ready for you to be going right into this interview? Um, and keep it quiet so the door is closed or the people you're living with know that you're gonna have this interview at this particular time and you'd appreciate them being quiet. Probably not a great idea to have a dog or a cat walk in front of the screen as you're doing this, you know? So think about, really be intentional actually about it. It's, it's a different venue and um, giving some thought to it, I think makes a lot of sense. I, I also think, um, I mean, I wear headsets here because I, as Andy and I started working on this, I, I have wind chimes on my deck and birds at a bird feeder and that noise comes through loud and clear, maybe sometimes louder than your own voice. So just be aware of ambient noises around it. Um, the other thing that as we were doing the research for this, we um, spent some time talking about is this one way video that now seems to be something that some employers are asking people to do. So they are setting you up with a video with a set of questions. You are answering those questions. You are not interacting with anybody but yourself. Um, and I guess I, I will say this, I've never seen one or participated in it. But we are, as we prepared for this, talking to Shaz and Lisa, they do exist. And so I think what you have to think about, again, is the setting. Almost 
pretending there's somebody at the other end of the screen that you're talking to, so you're engaging at some level. Um, I would ask who's going to view this, what, if you're being asked to do this, who's going to see it, how many people are going to see it. Um, if you feel more comfortable doing a phone interview and somebody's willing to do that, you might ask that question um, and how you will follow up with your own questions. So it puts you in a whole different circumstance. And I think Andy was talking about this earlier, knowing the people that you're going to meet with. So knowing who is going to see this video and how you have an opportunity to get feedback or give feedback as well. Um, I've also heard in a couple of instances, although you're allowed to do a practice, video when they set this up, sometimes you can't erase the practice. And so they use that as well. So just be cautious of that. You know, understand the context of everything that um, you're being asked to do in that particular venue. If you have questions, remember just to go ahead and put them on the Zoom chat uh, feature yep. and we'll answer them as we go yes. along. And we're going to say this all along today, since this is the last webinar, Andy and I have shared our email address at the end of this, and we are more than happy to be in touch with you and work with you as you have additional questions or want to get some feedback from us. So please don't hesitate. Either LinkedIn, we're both on LinkedIn, and we both have email addresses, and we would love to keep in touch with you to see how things are going. So to continue on this live interview, now we're talking an interview more with somebody on the other end of it, uh, one person or a search committee. Um, you want to, again, check the background information, um, who you're interviewing with. Um, I also think you, you need to understand, hopefully, how long is this interview going to be? Is it an hour? Is it an hour and 15 minutes? So this isn't the time when you would be um, calling out networks or relationships or something like that, or you know, connecting the links with college or something like that. This is the time that you want to set aside for answering questions um, and, and realizing it is a Q&A interview. You are being asked specific questions. You are being asked to answer those questions. Clear answers, not a lot of chit chat. And um, often, I mean, what we, when we were doing interviews in LART with a search committee, it was usually about an hour and 15 minutes, and it goes by quite quickly, actually. Um, so as much as you can, understand the context of it, and just keep in mind that this is the interview Q&A. It's not chit-chat or relationship building. Um, the other piece of this that I think is important, and this is something that I've really seen really amazing skills at. So you know what the job is, you know who you're being interviewed by at this point, you've done your research on the company. You then want to take a look at, before you're stepping into this interview, what are the skill sets that an organization is looking for? And we, we have a list here of some that might be intellectual ability, decision making, communication skills, technical knowledge, and also how can you demonstrate these skill sets, not just by saying, yes, I have these skill sets, but experiences, places on your position description and your resume that might demonstrate your experience in these particular areas. And think about sort of have this list in mind as you are answering questions, because sometimes you may find that questions don't directly address a particular skill set or example that you want to give, but once you've answered that question, you could add on to it in a way that shows your interest in a position, your understanding of a position, and your own ability to work with that position. So keeping that breadth of your own expertise and how to make sure everything that you want people to know about you is somehow, hopefully, gets into that interview. Um, I don't know if I, you want to I would like to add, um, there's not something we didn't put on this page because of uh, the, the crazy time that we're in. But if in the old days, if it was an in-person interview, uh, how you enter the room uh, is important. Um, so in the old days, if there were two people sitting there, you would go in and normally you would shake hands with that person, uh, with each person in the room. Uh, and then you would sit down, unless they give you specific instructions not to do that, like please sit down and then we'll go around the table and introduce ourselves, uh, it will depend. But then it's also important how you leave the room. And again, you stand up and you thank everyone and you typically 
uh, shake hands with everyone before you leave the meeting. That's not going to be the way it's going to transpire in the future, in the near future. But keep that in mind from a year from now or a year and a half from now, I think that will definitely come back. And so, I, I think you can apply that even into a Zoom setting, Andy, yes. how you introduce yourself or say, thank you for spending this time with me. I'm so excited to be interviewing with you. And again, at the end, express your thanks for people taking the time to meet with you. So not the physical, but the, you know, the, the wording of that, don't you think? Absolutely. And also, I would go back to the selection standard that Liz just described. Um, what you want to, as you think about the various uh, characteristics that they're looking for in a person that's, that would be filling this job, think about how you might be able to demonstrate your decision-making ability. Think about how you have used technology in a way that perhaps was innovative and that you might call that out. Or how you were especially skilled in making uh, connecting with other people. We're going to talk about this in a minute, given the, the, the kind of questions, because what they might be trying to get at is, are you a person that works by yourself or are you a person that works in a group and can effectively uh, create change or improvements in a process uh, uh, by, by those collaborative activities? All right. So now, Liz, talk about some <laughs> questions. Thank you. <laughs> So we made some examples of questions here, and I think um, there are many more that you can look at. I'm sure if you go to various websites, you'll see thoughts of questions. They tend to be open-ended questions. Um, they're going to ask you, and Andy's given an example here of an ex-gen company and the types of questions they might ask, um, and, and that you should be prepared to answer, actually. Um, and those are, you know, thank you for meeting with us. Tell us a little about yourself and what prompted you to interest in this. And this began, again, you have your resume, you have your letter of interest. And now in your own voice, you're talking about yourself in this role and why this particular role interests you. Can you tell us about the opportunity, why it appeals to you? How is this opportunity different from other professional areas or interests you might have? Um, explain the role and the opportunity and how prior assignments you have had um, might um, give you the right expertise for these responsibilities and challenges. Um, I think the other thing, and we didn't have this here, but I, they often will ask you questions that lead to your decision making or leadership qualities. So tell us about a success and a failure. Um, and I will say, um, it's really important to be able to talk about something that didn't work well for you, as well as something that did. Um, it's a sign of a leadership skill that you have reflected on that and know that something may not have worked as well as you thought. Um, it's also the time that I think is somewhat unique in our lives in that you are selling yourself. You are not selling, you're su selling successes that you've had or experiences that you've had in your life, but you are really, um, even though you may be using we and or I interchangeably, you are selling yourself to these people. And it's a really, really hard thing to do. It's not easy and yet, in interviews and in, in getting jobs, it's a really important thing to be able to do. Yep. Andy, do you want to add? Sure. Um, I think that, that what's really important is that um, you're able to convey that the ideas and approaches you might take uh, in this particular job compared with the uh, experiences you've had previously in a, a, perhaps it was a different kind of job, but their particular skills that are relevant to the to the, uh, the the characteristics that they're looking for in this uh, in filling this particular position. So, um, how might you be supportive of others is really important. How might you bring forward an innovation? But the only way to bring forward that innovation was to gain the uh, support of your colleagues around you. That's a very important skill, and people will will be uh, listening for that in terms of. Uh, whether you've had that kind of experience. Again, they're looking for someone who can build new processes, perhaps, or create innovative ideas uh, and present them in a way that uh, worked well uh, with others and that you actually um, perhaps were able to change course when things, there was too much pushback and you realized we can't go forward. There is a time constraint or there is a technology constraint. So 
So how did you adjust? People also want to know that, you know, you're not a black and white kind of person that is either going to go your way or you're, and, or you're going to be unhappy, you know, that kind of thing is not helpful. Um, describe your uh, experience, uh, interactions with various constituency groups. So you were able to uh, work with the people above you, you were able to work well with your colleagues, your peers, and you're able to supervise others in a way that um, is focused on getting the job done in the best way possible. Um, and also, um, as Liz just mentioned, again, talking about a failure, uh, people really are listening closely when you describe what didn't work well and what you learned from it and how you might have uh, adjusted your thought about the outcome and wh why that was important uh, in their understanding what you would be like as a colleague to work with. And then, I would, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. I, I would just add to that, it's, uh, you know, failure is a, is a relative world word. I mean, you, if you turned it around or changed course or something like that, um, you know, there are ways to express it in, in acknowledging that it wasn't going right, but solving a problem type thing that could be really helpful in an interview. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here about what, how much overlap there should be between a cover letter and interview responses. We do know that there shouldn't be a uh, conflict between those two. They should be in terms of the, uh, what you've described happened is, is uh, the same. But I think that the, as Liz pointed out earlier, in the person-to-person -person, uh, situation, it's your opportunity to, on a, on a very personal level, to describe how you were able to, how you were able to push forward what the innovation or change was, and how you felt about some of the challenges along the way. And that would you, you would probably not cover all of that in a cover letter or a letter of interest. This is a more personalized reflection than people will say, gee, she really did a good job of that. It looks, sounds like it was a really rough situation. That's what you want to convey. Yeah, probably a little more detail in an interview, although I think you have to be aware of your time at any given time. And it may be as you're going into an interview, there are other examples that come up that weren't in the cover letter and that's okay as well. Yeah, yeah. They will close, they'll give you, you know, as they get to the end of the hour, the hour and 15 minutes, they will end, end with a closing question. And often that is like, is there a question that we didn't ask you that you thought we would? That's a great opportunity to circle back, fill in any holes that they didn't ask you about that you think are important to the particular uh, job as described in the job description. And then they will say, what question do you have, what questions do you have for us? And that is also an opportunity. You should become prepared with five or six questions. Maybe there won't be enough time for that. Um, typically what we've seen is, is that you, the, the candidate will ask a question and one or two people might respond or they might go around the room if there's more than a couple of people there. And then you should be prepared to sort of engage them in conversation. They're gonna watch you and see how well you are able to interact with others and how you might listen closely to what that person said and that might follow on. Could you clarify that? I didn't quite understand that. That's, that's very much okay. It means that you're a good listener in terms of what the, the subject matter is. I think what's important when you get to the closing questions is even if there are other things that you want to add, remember that you are asking the questions now so you are listening and taking in information. Um, we've seen at times when people try to sell themselves again in this and it, it, the skill really is here listening to what your audience is telling you about this. The other interesting thing about questions, it can be that during the course of your interview, something comes up that you want to ask about. And ask, it, it, you want to look at your audience, so you're making sure you're asking questions that anybody in the audience could respond to if they're more than one person in the audience. But it, it, sometimes there are things that come up during an interview that you're curious about, and that can also be a good question. You don't want to ask about salary. You don't want to ask about start date, any of that type of thing. It's engaging. You have thought about questions in advance that you are interested in or during the interview that you're interested in that creates that conversation with your audience. Right. I don't think we can overstate the watching and listening of the people in the room. These are colleagues. They may come from a different department. They may have an ongoing disagreement of the way to go forward in the selection of the next technology that they're going to purchase. 
So you don't want to get in the middle of that. You don't want to weigh in on either app, but pay attention to that so that in your response, you would say, well, in our past, in my past role, I was able to contribute X, Y, Z in terms of trying to figure out what was the right uh, software to buy for this particular application kind of thing. So just continuing on the venue where you're sitting and preparing, you want to make sure that you dress appropriately for the interview. And that is in person and virtually. Andy um, came dressed for the interview today, as you'll see. Um, so um, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's hard to know what appropriate is. I would err on the side of being more conservative on this. Like if maybe it's not a tie, but maybe it's a jacket and a sweater or at least an Oxford shirt or something like that. I mean, know, know your audience and know the type of company. There are companies that still do have a pretty specific dress code. So the more you can find out about that, um, the better. And um, th so that, and then, um, arrive early and be prepared. So uh, even for a Zoom, you can log into a Zoom early and have yourself set up and ready in your environment. Um, and I think that is what you don't wanna do, I think is be the last person that signs into the Zoom or, you know, I mean, for instance, when we do these webinars, we set ourselves up to make sure our PowerPoint and everything is in place. So when we go live, we are ready to go. And you want to take on the same approach. You, you want to be the person that's ready and waiting for these people um, to, to talk to you. Your cell phone should be off or possibly not even in the room at the same time if it's possible. Um, you want to keep an eye on the time. You have X number of questions to answer in a certain amount of time. If you can learn that in advance, it's very helpful. Um, but you, you don't want to spend the entire time answering the first question you're asked. So be aware of the time that you have to, to spend with this group of people. Great. Great. All right. So the interview is complete. You felt it was very successful. What do you do now? Well, after the interview, we would recommend that you write a note of thanks to all of the people who were in the room with you during the interview. And ideally, if you can collect all their email addresses, there's nothing, nothing better than an individualized, personalized email. Thank you. So it doesn't have to be long, but thank you very much for meeting with me. I'm very excited about the work of this department, and I could see myself participating well in that environment, something like that. And um, if you don't have all the individual email addresses, then choose the lead person who you've been interacting with. Ask if that person would share this email, your email note with the others, and in the same way, uh, thank the person for the uh, opportunity to meet with them, how much you enjoyed it, and so on. A generic email is much, that's very timely, is much better than a one that comes uh, delayed next week, 10 days. That's not it. It's got to be within 24 hours, and um, you, uh, we have been surprised. I've been surprised how often that can make a difference for people. This person's very organized together and immediately thanked us for the job uh, possibility of, the, of an interview. That was, that was, that's awfully, always well received. And truthfully surprised at the number of people who don't do it. Right. Yeah. We didn't get really, an, we didn't get an email of thanks from that person. You know, we've right. heard that. So, right. um, so if you're offered the position, um, you shouldn't start to think about it. Then you should have been prepared. You should have been preparing for that call before that. So, What's going to happen if they offer me the job? What do I think? Do I really want this job? Have I found out enough about it that it really pleases me? Or would I really rather be working for that other company, but they haven't given me an offer yet? And I'm not sure about how to make the timing. So you can sort of sense if the person that has uh, given you the hiring manager has said, we really would like you to join our institution. We can't wait for you to decide. Uh, that this would be the right uh, decision for you. You're going to have to feel it out. Most places are very comfortable if you give them uh, 24 hours or 48 hours over the weekend. You need to have a decent reason for why that's important. If you jump at the job right away, I think that's also okay. Say, this is great. I, I'm so happy. Let me get back to you on some of the details and uh, like a start date. I would think that it's really important for you to um, know up front about the salary and location. So 
if they offer you a salary at that moment, um, think about, well, that salary is less than I've been making for the last five years. So is that, is that a reason for turning down the job? Or in this particular time, is that a reason to have maybe a little conversation, say that I've been earning that amount of money for the past five years and was kind of hoping that there might be an opportunity to make slightly more. You want to keep that conversation impersonal, sort of objective. You don't want to say, well, I'm really worth more than that. What you really want to be is as excited and forthcoming in terms of what your expectations might be. If, if the location uh, was described earlier and suddenly now you turn and say, well, I have to ask my spouse or my colleague, my partner, whatever, whether they would move to Chicago. Well, that's really not the moment to ask that, to, to, to sort of spill that out. You should have asked that beforehand. Like, if I get this job, do you think you'd be happy going to Chicago with me? That's the time. And then you're able to say, well, there are a few issues maybe I could get some help with. My spouse needs to relocate as well. She has a good job in the technology field. Uh, would there be any way that uh, she might be able to access your uh, uh, database of jobs at your institution as well? Something like that. They won't necessarily say, well, we're going to hire her. But they might, you never know. And I think it's really important, however, to think about that up front. A couple of questions before we go to references. Um, I think you should look into the camera when you're on Zoom. Um, the challenge may be if there's more than one person. Um, you know, so you've got this Brady Bunch Zoom thing going on, which can be really challenging, or it also can be challenging if you have a couple of people in one room. Um, with a zoom camera, um, but I would say as much as you can look up and look into it. That is really important uh, And just I mean you, you might even play with your camera I mean, it's your when your head goes down like maybe if when I'm looking at notes You probably see the top of my head, which probably isn't what you want to be seeing so I would experiment a little bit with you're looking at yourself much as that can be hard to do um, to see what it looks like when you do different movements or hand movements and things like that. Um, the length of an email, I like that you asked about if you've gone through multiple interviews, because I still think it's important to send thank yous, in particular people who may have helped you participate in those multiple interviews. I don't think it has to be really long. I think what maybe would be helpful is to comment on something in particular as you move through, especially if it's someone that has been in more than one interview, you might, there might be something you picked up on or thank them for helping you as you got into the next phase of the process or something like that. So I don't know, two or three sentences, maybe Andy, do you think? Not, I mean, one is probably too short. Not, not, right. Yeah. Right. But two or three that are just, you know, say thank you and looking forward to the next step. And then maybe something about the process that um, um, you struck you as you were going through it. Um, taking notes, this yeah. makes me comment on, um, we have seen people read their introductions in person. Uh, it doesn't go over well. Um, yeah. I guess I, I, I would be careful about taking notes. I think the more what you're doing is you're even in Zoom and virtual, you are trying to um, be interacting face to face, eye to eye, more than taking notes. That's my, if, if there's something you need to jot down that is a point of reference you want to come back to. Um, we have seen people ask multi part questions. Right. You can ask people to repeat the question. You can even say, I think there are three parts of that question. So let me start with this one. And I might have to come back and ask you for the other one. It's okay to do that and acknowledge that rather than try and write it down and refer to it on a piece of paper. And then at the end, it's okay, I think, to say, did I answer all parts of that question for you? And you're creating then a conversation back and forth with the interviewer, and that's also a good idea. That you're the, it shows that you're a collaborative worker right. and that you want to be able to fully, you've got that person's attention and that you, you're, you're trying to be as responsive as you possibly can. And yes, I would say in an informational interview, it is okay to take notes and you might want to let the person know that you're going to be doing that possibly. So, you know, you, you could even ask them to repeat something or just confirm something that they said so that they're aware that you're taking notes down because informational is a little different. You may be asking actually for information that it's important to make a note of. Yeah. 
Um, so references, um, this is also a really, really important piece of your whole package. Um, think about who you want for references for different positions. Um, give them a heads up in advance. Um, it's not a bad idea to send them the ad or position description and a little bit about your interest in the position and why you think it might be appropriate. So um, the more they know about it in advance, the better I think it is. Um, and make sure that you have good and current contact information about your references. So what you're sharing with your future employer about um, make sure you have the right information, phone number and email address for them. Great. The other thing I just wanted to add, Andy, when you talked about the salary negotiation, it's, yeah. it's a package. So there may be benefits or time off or relocation things. So make sure in addition to the salary that you're looking at the whole package that comes with a particular position. There may also be uh, tuition remission kind of benefits if it's an academic institution where you could take courses. Uh, that's also, also very important to professional development. And, uh, and any time I think that you can expand the skills uh, while you're doing the job as well is also uh, real value. And I think okay. you... Yep, Go some ahead. companies offer that as well, money right. for classes or tuition reimbursement. Right, right, right. So um, preparation is a key element uh, for a successful job and for you, as we as we would described. So we've been thinking about, well, what if there are pandemic-related questions that may arise during the interview? And this is, I think, really, really important. You should be prepared to answer uh, questions. Um, and Thinking about this, for those Fulbrighters that returned uh, earlier than, than, than they expected, um, think about uh, um, answers that are honest, uh, thoughtful, and positive. And um, I don't know, Liz, why don't you start us off here there? Well, I think what's, what, what you want to do is, I, these are hard times with difficult experiences, and I think if you can turn this into a, a positive spin to some degree, challenging and opportunistic, I guess, is how you might think about it. Um, that I think that is how you want to try and um, so, so people see you creating, um, I don't know, lemonade from lemons, maybe, <laughs> type thing. It's like, it's very hard, but but being resilient and looking at your experiences, both honestly, thoughtfully, and I would say proactively is probably what would be the best if it's possible. Um, one of the things um, we haven't really said, expressed this directly is expressing frustration with a former experience or employer does not come across in a positive way. There are ways to constructively express things that create more of a learning experience that you've had versus just um, frustration with a former situation or employer. An example of that may be that the, it was a small startup operation and expanded very, very fast. And trying to keep up with that expansion presented certain challenges. Well, describe those challenges. That doesn't say that it was overwhelming and you were just fraught with, with unhappiness, it just goes to show that uh, you were able to be resilient, which as Liz just mentioned was important. So, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna talk, uh, go back to the Fulbright uh, returnees and talk about how that uh, transpired, how the, what you were doing was interrupted by the pandemic and what did you learn before the pandemic occurred? And then what did you learn about yourself in having to leave so quickly? Um, and overall, can you, can you, have you been able to think about the positive experiences that you will take forward in your career? So again, this shows a, a sense of resilience, but also shows an ability to say, okay, this happened. It happened very fast. This is, upon reflection, this is what I think about it. And, and then this is what messages I have told myself that I want to keep uh, so that going forward, I, I refer back to this experience in a positive way. Um, so ahead. if the salary, I'm looking at questions actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, if the salary really is too low, I think you have to say that. I, there's a 
good possibility during this, this recruiting process, you will have an opportunity to ask what the salary range is. Um, it, it's really hard. I think what we find is when it, as search consultants, we ask those questions of candidates so we know what the ranges are or what the package needs to look like or what the challenges of moving an individual or a family is. And in some ways, what I think we're suggesting to you is you have these conversations with yourself, with your partner, with your family, whoever it is. So you have a sense of what the range would be. Would you be willing to move and where would you willing, be willing to move? What does a package need to look like? And my hope would be um, either it's published at some level as the ads are being put out or you get to a point before you're in a final stage where you might know what the range is. But if it is simply too low, you just need to say that, I think. I mean, it's hard to get through that whole process and have come to that conclusion. Um, you can also say, here is the range that I was expecting. Is it close? Is it, are you, how far apart are you? So think about what the difference is and what could make that difference up. Yeah. I mean, it can be a conversation. It can be a negotiation. Some places are hard and fast and some places, you know, are willing to make some adjustments potentially. Yeah. And I'm going to answer a question, but this comes back, to, I think, to the to the questions here is, can you do the job while working from home? This is related to the pandemic period. Can you do the job working from home? Are you a bit willing to eventually come to an office? And uh, I think that this gets to uh, a particular question or a part of the question, which is, what's your ideal work environment? Yeah. That That is a tricky question, um, because if you say... <laughs> I really like working by myself. I've learned this during the pandemic that if I work from home, I'm really, you know, much more productive. You have to balance that with, well, this is a team research effort, for example, and we really, you know, you all going to have to be part of the team as we get going in uh, by the first of the next year, something like that. So I think that there's no ideal answer. You have to be balancing both what's honest for you with what you uh, have found out about that particular company. And ideally, if you talk to people who work at that company, they'll tell you it's a great work environment or it's very hierarchical. And if you're not a hierarchical person or, or you really don't do well in that at all, then you got to explore that a little bit more. And then you can turn it back if it's a conversation and say, well, how are you structured in this particular department? And uh, if that's where a conversation where you will get the most information from them, and they will learn the most about you. And that's really important in an interview. Right. Yeah, you, you, you certainly don't want to be in a position where you don't know enough about a job and you're being asked, you're being given an offer. I mean, I think um, it, it's a tricky question and it depends upon the circumstances of the interview to some degree. There are ways, I think Andy was just talking about this, to ask questions when you're, the opportunity for you to do that comes up. Um, and it, if you have specific things you want to know, you might um, phrase your questions in that way. So you're getting more information about the job as you're asking your questions. So here's another question about the, that the interviewers, you thought the interviewers were going to tell you more about the job. And in the end, you got to the end of the interview and you didn't know much more about the job. So, uh, and that you don't have enough information to even know if you wanted the job. I think that's worthy of a follow-up uh, kind of in your thank you email. You might say, I look forward to learning more about the position. And you might list three or four bullets that you felt were not fully covered. Right. If the people are really interested in you, they may call you or, or be back in contact. But I think that's reasonable. If you keep it on, not on a personal level, but very objective, I think that would be important. We ran out of time. I would have liked to have asked you more about X, Y, Z, that kind of thing. And I would not wait until an offer, actually. Right. I mean, you, it's, it, if that's the only time you have to ask those questions and you can, you know, really professionally say, I, I'm excited about this opportunity and there are things that I need to know more about before I make my decision. But hopefully you would get that information beforehand through the interactions. Yeah. Some of it, you, you also have to um, figure out the person who's interviewing you is a HR representative, perhaps, and may not know enough of the specifics around that particular uh, department and how it works. So talking with the hiring manager before actually being offered the job 
would be ideal or talking to someone else in the department, that would be ideal. But to get a better sense of what the actual job responsibilities are, I think would be uh, a task that you wanna accomplish before you even consider the offer they're going to make. Um, are salary and benefits best discussed via email or via video or call? I would hope it would be video call, not email. Um, there is an advantage to seeing an offer in email not over the phone or video because you have time to absorb it. Um, would your approach change? I would certainly say if you are asked to respond this via email, you want to very carefully look at the entire offer and really compose a letter almost as you think about an email, thanking them for the offer and how much you appreciate it. And then if you've got issues about it or things that you need to have clarified, ask those things or ask for a phone call. Thanking for the offer and asking for a phone call to talk it through because you have some questions could also be a possibility. Right. On the benefits question or benefits part of that question, um, I think people are more uh, in tune with answering questions about benefits. They may refer you to the HR office but the benefits are so different these days. And if you live in Rhode Island and the job is in Massachusetts and you're not sure that the coverage extends to Rhode Island, that's a very straightforward objective question that probably can be answered by someone who's not the hiring manager, but it's worth going back and asking them simply, email. I'm, I live in Rhode Island, I'm confused about how the coverage extends to outside of the, the mm -hmm. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. something like that. I also think, again, um, you, you may be asked, you may even be asked, like in some of these venues, like Indeed.com, what your salary range is. It, and so um, I, li I like to think that if it's a job you really want, that the salary range can be flexible enough. Now, if you're out of work, you really need to work. I mean, it, it, I know the circumstances vary. I would give a range maybe or talk about flexibility, but I, if they're really asking you for salary information, I think it's fair to provide it within a range. Right. Because it's helping them make the decision. And if it's way out of the range, then you're going to know that early on. Yeah. Um, in Massachusetts, for example, um, as a recruiter, we were una unable or prohibited from asking how much do you currently make. Um, so talk about ranges. If you offer that as a candidate up is that I'm presently paid X, Y, Z. I know the recruiter will be happy to hear that uh, because then that sort of lets that person know right away that if they want to recruit you, uh, that it's going to take another $2,000 or whatever an annual salary to really win, your, win you over. So I think that that's uh, a decision you have to make. Um, I, um, there's a question about negotiating your salary. So um, I think women do have a harder time doing it. Um, and um, I mean, we know the data about women's pay nationally. So um, I, it, I think it depends upon the circumstance. I mean, if they're offering something that is what you want, I don't think you need to negotiate. Um, I. I think you need to feel whole in this piece of this job in addition to the actual job. So am I being paid fairly for the position that, that I'm being offered? Um, do I, you know, why is the salary, you may ask, why is the salary at this range? I'm making this now, which is more, or, you know, I was hoping it might be more. So I wouldn't be hesitant to ask for more or what the range is or say your expectation was different. Um, I don't know, it, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, there's no right answer there. But you have to be attuned to the, the, conver the person that you're having the conversation with. Yep. And if that person is um, rigid, uh, then you may not be able to do that. There may be another way to do that. Okay. Yet yeah, some some places really simply do not have the ability to right. negotiate. This is what the budget is for, and this is it. So it 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 may not matter, male or female. This is what the position pays. Yeah. Um, I I do think it's important to have a sense of what you want to make, and there are ways to look at what positions should pay, um, or are paying to give you points of comparison. 
I mean, the worst thing that you want, the, I mean, the hard part is um, you don't necessarily know unless you know people in the organization where it sits in the hierarchy and what other people are at that same pay range. It's, you know, so you're kind of walking into it a little blindly, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, the question here was, is that if they, if they say early in the process, the salary is X, and it's, you know, there's no, that's the top of the, the range or whatever in this particular area, uh, then should you try and go in and negotiate on benefits or time off? My guess is be careful with that. Uh, I think that if they've told you up front, they want you to be fully aware that that's what their limit is. They're not, it's not penal, they're not, in their minds, they're not penalizing you. They're trying to make their budget work and they're trying to recruit you, uh, the very best person they possibly can for this particular role. You might ask, you know, is there flexibility around working from home, working in the office? Uh, maybe that's a possibility. Uh, or you might state that differently by say, what's the, what's the institution's policy on uh, working from home one day a week or something like that? It's, I think it is important to know as you're going into a search, what's important for you. Right. Um, where you work is important. Working from home is that important. What are the benefits you need in addition to salary that are important? Are you someone who wants to travel and so you want time off? I mean, I do, I think it is important. And I think as you look at that list of things that are important to you, do you want education and would they be willing to pay for it if you, you know, completed certain courses? Those are all things you can talk about a future employer and some employers have flexibility. Some really truly do not have flexibility if you are public. I mean, it's interesting if you look at the difference between a public institution and a private institution in the academic world. Um, private institutions have more flexibility in what they offer to individual positions. Publics, the information is public and it's very hard to be flexible. So you take into consideration their ability to be flexible as you're asking for it. And I, I say, if you know what really is important to you, in addition to the job asking for it or exploring it with them, it's not such a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, it's better to have the expectations set then than a month in to say, oh, by the way, did I tell you I really need to work a day a week at home? You know, explore that before you commit to a position. There's a question about finding the right balance uh, before entering the workforce at the right salary. I think the way to really understand that is to get a better sense of what salary ranges are uh, if for that particular role across the, the industry. And there are different ways you can try and find that out. But um, in this particular environment, I think in the next year or two, maybe even three years, that uh, institutions are going to be trying to hold down the salary increase. There's no question about it. And I think- Very thoughtful question, actually. It's a thoughtful question. And I just, I don't have much hope for you be, to be able to think that you're going to enter the, at, the, at what was the high point or the <laughs> midpoint of that particular uh, kind of role. I think the job market is going to be tight that you're just going to have to say, okay, that's 15% off of what I thought I would have gotten, you know, two years ago, but we are where we are and maybe it'll come back and maybe I'll have a chance to move up within the organization or maybe exactly. if necessary, uh, have to leave this organization, but I'll have had all this important experience and that will position me better to get a higher salary somewhere else. I mean, it's a really tough time because you all need to earn a certain amount of money to survive. Right. And that right. is very important. And you don't want to feel that you're being compromised in that. At the same time, it, it, this is you know, like no other time really, a job market where companies are probably gonna offer left. We are seeing salary reductions, salary caps, furloughs, layoffs. And so you're, you're in that marketplace where all of that is happening. And one of the things Andy said that I think can be really important is if this is an institution that speaks to you in some way being there during this time could afford you opportunities of promotion or advancement or experience that could be really valuable. Yeah. There was another offline question here that said, um, what if the interviewer or the hiring manager say, what, ex what salary would you expect? That's a tricky question. Um, I think it's easy to say, 
I've been working uh, for the last five years for this particular organization and every year my salary has increased 5% or 2% or whatever it is, be honest, and then say, you know, it's always my hope in changing uh, positions from one institution to another uh, to earn 15% more. I don't know whether that's possible or not, but usually changing jobs uh, for a more responsible position, that seems a reasonable amount. If, if you've already, you should do that calculation ahead. You shouldn't say that if you don't believe it, but um, that's always something to say. And then they could say, well, that's gonna be too high or something like that. But at least you sort of put it out there as a standard and that is a standard or was a standard. What yep. other questions we have? Right. Um, if you're just starting out, what's the answer to the salary expectation? Like if you've never worked before in an organization. Yeah. Again, um, that's where being better informed about what jobs pay yeah. uh, is important. You probably can do a little bit of research. I mean, first of all, I think you want to look at what you think you need to earn, maybe, would right. be one way of looking at it to begin with. Um, you're new, so you're willing to be flexible. And I think if you did a little bit of research, um, you might find the ranges for some of those positions. Yeah, that's what I would suggest. All right. I'm close to that. I, I, I want to say, and I know Andy's going to echo this, that, um, thank you to the Fulbright Association for letting us do these webinars, first of all. And Andy and I both would encourage you to reach out to us with additional questions. Um, Andy has a nice success story about somebody he's been working with on a resume and, and a letter and an interview process. Maybe you want to share that, Andy, because those are the types of things we like. Well, I think it turned out well because the person, this is a Fulbright person, got the interview. Now, I don't know whether she's got the job yet. I'm hoping that I hear next week that she got the job, but she made changes to her resume. She improved her letter of interest. Uh, she uh, got scheduled for an interview, and that, I think, happened yesterday. Hopefully, uh, it all turned out well. So we're, we're happy to help you. So good luck. Um, when you go to interview, make sure that you're relaxed and have fun with it because uh, you'll be able to show off your skills in an even better fashion. So all the best.